Hello everybody, Angel Arts is here, right next to our favorite lieutenant. Look at him working, look at him working. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna be talking about the lieutenant at this moment, because we've got codexes to read. So, as I said in the earlier, in the earlier, um, video, if you're not interested in these codexes, feel free to move on to the next episode. So, council races, council races. Asari Military Doctrine. The Asari Military resembles a collection of tribal warrior bands with no national structure. Each community organizes its own unit as the locals see fit and elect a leader to command them. Units from populous cities are large and well-equipped, while those from farm villages may only be a few women with small arms. There is no uniform. Everyone wears what they like. The Asari Military is not an irregular militia, however. Those who serve are full-time professionals. The average Asari Huntress is in the maiden stage of her life and has devoted 20 to 30 years of studying the martial arts. Asari chose to be warriors at a young age, and their education from that point is dedicated to sharpening the mind and body for that sole purpose. When they retire, they possess an alarming proficiency for killing. Huntresses fight individually or in pairs, depending on the tactics preferred in their town. One-on-one, -on -one, a Huntress is practically unbeatable, possessing profound tactical insight, a Hunter's eye, and a Dancer's grace and alacrity. Biotics are common enough that some capability is a requirement to be trained as a Huntress. Lack of biotic talent excludes a young Asari from military service. While fluid and mobile, Asari can't stand up in a firestorm the way a Krogan, Torian, or human could. Since their units are small and typically lack heavy armor and support weapons, they are almost incapable of fighting a conventional war, particularly one of a defensive nature. So Asari units typically undertake special operations missions. Like an army of ninja, they are adept at ambush, infiltration, and assassination, demoralizing and defeating their enemies through intense, focused guerrilla strikes. As a popular Turian puts it, the Asari are the finest warriors in the galaxy. Fortunately, there are not many of them. Asari Religion The panesthesistic uh, mainstream Asari religion is Siari, which translates roughly as all is one. The faithful agree on certain core truths. The universe is a consciousness, every life within it is an aspect of the greater whole, and death is a merging of one spiritual energy back into the greater universal consciousness. Siaris don't specifically believe in reincarnation, they believe that spiritual energy returned to the universal consciousness upon death will be eventually be used to fill in new mortal vessels. New mortal vessels. Siari became popular after the Asari left their homeworld and discovered their ability to meld with nearly any form of life. This ability is seen as proof that all life is fundamentally similar. Siari priestesses see their role as promoting unity between the disparate shards of the universe's awareness. Before the rise of the, of the Siari pantheism, Asari religions were as diverse as their political opinions. The strongest survivor of those days is the monotheistic religion worshipping the goddess Athame. Like the Asari, the goddess cycles through the triple aspects of maiden, matron, and matriarch. Biology Salarians Salarians are noted for their high-speed metabolism, which allows them to function on just one hour of sleep a day. I did not know that Salarians only needed one hour of sleep. Wow, I learn something every day with these. With these. Um, their minds and bodies work faster than most sapient races, making them seem restless or hyperactive. The drawback of this active metabolism is a short lifespan of around 40 human years. The Salarians are amphibian haplodiploid -dipl egg layers. Unfertilized eggs produce males, and fertilized eggs produce females. Interesting. Unfertilized. So you can control whether a Salarian is male or female based on whether the eggs are fertilized or unfertilized. Huh. Once a year, a Salarian female will lay a clutch of a dozen eggs. Social rules prevent all but a fraction of, from being fertilized. As a result, 90% of the species is male. Oh, that's why we don't see that many Salarian females. Salarians have photographic memories and rarely forget a fact. They also possess a form of psychological imprinting, tending to defer to those they knew in their youth. Salarian hatching is a solemn ritual in which the clan Dalatras matriarch isolates herself with the eggs. The young Salarians psychologically imprint on her and, and, and tend to defer to her wishes. During the hatching of daughters, the Dalatrases of the mother and father's clans are present at the imprinting. This ensures the offspring have equal royalty, loyalty to both, ensuring the desired dynast, dynastic and political unity. Salarian Special Tasks Group Salarian intelligence field agents, are, field agents are grouped into an organization called the Special Tasks Group. STG operators work in an independent cells 
performing dangerous missions such as counterterrorism, infiltration, reconnaissance, assassination, and sabotage. The STG is a proactive organization puncturing warism trends before they become movements. At any time, a dozen groups are cooperating covertly within the lawless terminus systems, sowing dissent among the various factions. Civilian analysts also note how troublesome hinge point individual individuals in terminus frequently meet unexpected deaths. STG operators are feared throughout the galaxy for their clear-eyed, remorselessly remorseless practicality. They are willing to do whatever it takes to achieve their mission, even if it kills civilians or results in the team's own destruction. In many ways, they are akin to the Council Spectres. Recently, a number of SCG cells have been redeployed from Solarian Union. It is assumed they are in the Terminus and Attican Traverse, investigating reports of Geth beyond the Perseus Veil. Turians Biology The Turian homeworld, Palavin, has a metal-poor core, generating a weak magnetic field and allowing more solar radiation into the atmosphere. To deal with this, most forms of life on Palavin evolved some form of metallic exoskeleton to protect themselves. Their reflective plate-like skins makes Turians less susceptible to long-term low-level radiation exposure, but they do not possess any sort of natural armor. A Turian's thick skin does not stop projectiles and directed energy bolts. Although life on Palavin is carbon-based and oxygen-breathing, it is built on dextroamino acids. This places the Turians in a distinct minority on the galactic stage. The Quarians are the only other known sapient dextroprotein race. The few food of humans, Asari or Salarians, who evolved in level levo-amino acid-based biospheres, will at best pass through Turian systems without providing any nutrition. At worst, it will trigger an allergic reaction that can be fatal if not immediately treated. Turians Government The Turian government is a hierarchical metriocracy. While it has great potential for misuse, there, that this is tempted, tempered by the civic duty and personal responsibility Turians learned in childhood. Turians have 27 citizenship tiers. My gosh, beginning with civilians, client, races, and children, the initial period of military service is the second tier. Formal citizenship is conferred at the third tier after boot camp. For client races, citizenship is granted after individual musters out. Higher ranked citizens are expected to lead and put protect subordinates. Lower ranked citizens are expected to obey and support superiors. Promotion to another tier of citizenship is based on the personal assessment of one's superior and co-rankers. Throughout their lives, Turians ascend to higher tiers and are occasionally demoted to lower ones. The stigma associated with demotion lies not on the individual but on those who promoted him when he wasn't ready for additional responsibility. That is interesting. This curbs the tendency to promote individuals into positions beyond their capabilities. Huh. Settling into a role and rank is not considered stagnation. Turians value knowing one's own limitations more than ambitions. At the top are the Primarchs who each rule a colonization cluster. Primarchs vote on matters of national import. They otherwise maintain a hands-off policy, trusting the citizens on each level below them to do their jobs competently. Turians enjoy broad freedom, so as long as one, of one completes his duties and does not prevent others from completing theirs, nothing's forbidden. For example, there are no laws against recreational drug use, but if someone is unable to complete his duties due to drug use, his superiors step in. Judicial proceedings are interventions. Peers express their concern and try to convince the offender to change. If rehabilitation fails, Turians have no qualms about sentencing dangerous individuals to life at hard labor for the state. Um, Non-council races. Geth. Armatures. Armatures are quadruped alt terrain heavy weapon platforms akin to the armored fighting vehicles of other races. Geth being synthetic intelligences, armatures are not crude vehicles, but intelligent entities capable of independent decision-making and learning. Armatures are equipped with heavy kinetic barriers. Their main cannon mounted on the articulated head turret appears to be a highly efficient conventional mass accelerator. It is capable of firing in anti-personnel and anti-tank nodes. Some armatures carry drones into battle, presumably for reconnaissance purposes. Others host a swarm of insect-sized repair microbots. Krogan Culture the harsh Krogan homeworld conditioned the Krogan psychologically for toughness, just as it did the body. Krogan have always had a tendency to be selfish, unsympathetic, and blunt. They respect strength and self-reliance and are neither surprised nor, off nor offended by treachery. The weak and selfless do not live long. In their culture, looking out for number one is simply a matter of course. After the defeat in the rebellions, the very concept of Krogan leadership was discredited. Whether a warlord could once command enough power, where a warlord could once command enough power to bring entire solar systems to heal 
and become overlord. These days, it is rare for a single leader to have more than 1,000 warriors swear allegiance to him. Most Krogan trust and serve no one but themselves. This solitary attitude stems in part from a deep sense of fatalism and futility, a profound social effect of the genophage that caused Krogan numbers to dwindle to a relative handful. Not only are they angry that the entire galaxy seems out to get them, the Krogan are also generally pessimistic about the race's chances of survival. The surviving Krogan see no point in building for the future. There will be no future. The Krogan live with an attitude of kill, pillage, and be selfish. Tomorrow, we die. That does explain a lot of Krogan's personalities. That is really interesting. Krogan, military doctrine. Krogan, ta Krogan tactics were built on nutritional mass unit warfare. Equipped with cheap, rugged gear, troop transformation formations are powerful but inflexible. Command and control was very centralized. Soldiers in the field who saw a target contacted their commanders behind the lines to arrange fire support. Since the genophage, the Krogan can no longer afford the casualties of the old horde attacks. The Battlemasters are a match for any ten soldiers of another species. To a Battlemaster, killing is a science. They focus on developing a clean, brute force economy of motion that exploits their brutal strengths to incapacitate enemies with a swift, single blow of overwhelming power. This change of focus from mass unit warfare to maximal efficiency has increased employment demand in the fields of security and muscle for hire. Due to the unsavory reputation of the Krogan, most of these jobs are on the far side of the law. Battlemasters are not spit and polished, but they do believe in being well armed and equipped, preferably with a gun for each limb. They are callous and brutal, but methodical and disciplined. They use any means at their disposal to achieve their goals, no matter how reprehensible. Hostage taking and genocide are acceptable means to ensure a quiet occupation with few Krogan casualties. The Krogan serving with Saren's four forces appear to be returning to the old style of mass attritional combat. They also work in close cooperation with supporting Geth units, who fill the roles occupied by combat drones and other armies. Biotics are rare among Krogan. Those that exist are viewed with suspicion and fear. The Krogan see this aura of fear as a usual quality for an officer and often promote them. Combat drones and other high-tech equipment are likewise in short supply. Quarians, Law and Defense Although the Conclave establishes civil law, much as any planet-based democracy, enforcement and trials are more unique. After the flight from the Geth, there were there are few constables to police the millions of civilians aboard the fleet so the Navy parceled out Marine squads to maintain order and enforce the law. Today, Quarian Marines have evolved training and tactics akin to civilian police, but remain adept in combat in the confined spaces of a starship, and fully under the command of the military. Once taken into the custody, the accused is brought before the ship's captain for judgment. While the ship's council may make recommendations, tradition holds that the captain has absolute authority in matters of discipline. Most are lenient, assigning additional or more odious maintenance tasks aboard the ship. Persistent recidivists are accidentally left on the next habitable world. Interesting. This practice of abandoning criminals on other people's planets... Oh! Abandoning criminals on other people's planets is a point of friction between the Quarians and the systems they pass through. That's... That's kind of a sleazeball thing to do. You're too, you're too like... I guess, too afraid to punish them normally that you... You're just gonna leave them for somebody else to take care of. Let them be other people's problems. Come on, Quarians. What's wrong with you? Captains really have another choice. With space and resources at the premium, supporting a non-productive prison population is not an option. That makes sense, but... I don't know. That's just a, still a sleazeball thing to do. In the early years, many Quarian freighters were armed and used as irregular privateers. Civilian ships still show a strong preference for armament, making them unpopular targets for pirates. Though they have built, rebuilt their military, there are still mere hundreds of warships to protect tens of thousands of ships. The Quarian Navy follows strict routines of patrol, and takes no chances. If the intent of an approaching ship can't be ascertained, they shoot to kill. Quarian's Religion The ancient Quarians practiced ancestor worship. Even after abandoning fate for secularism, Quarians continued to revere the wisdom of elders. As time passed and technology advanced, they inevitably turned their knowledge to preserving the personalities and memories of elderly as computer virtual intelligences. These recordings became a repository of knowledge and wisdom stored in central data bank and available through any extranet connection. They held no illusions that this was a form of immortality. Like all virtual intelligence, their electronically preserved ancestors were not truly sapient. This was considered a surmountable problem. 
sapiens could surely be reduced to simple mathematics. The Quarians began exhaustive research into creating artificial intelligence so they could learn to escape the bonds of mortality and give their ancestral records true awareness. Unfortunately, the life of the life the Quarians created did not accept the same truth as they did. The Geth destroyed the ancestor databanks when they took over. In the centuries since they evacuated their homeworld, most Quarians have returned to religion in various forms. Many believe that the rise of the Geth and the destruction of their ancestors were chastisement for arrogantly forsaking the old ways and venerating self-made idols. Others have a more philosophical outlook, believing that the race was indeed arrogant, but no supernatural agency lay behind the Geth revolt. Rather, the Quarians' actions wrought their own doom. Either way, every Quarian would agree that their own hubris cost them their homeworld. Humanity and Systems Alliance. Um, humanity has encountered many galactic species. Wars have been few, but mistrust is rife. Politically, the Alliance is a peaceful trade partner of the Turians. As a practical matter, however, there is a simmering antagonism and bigotry between both populations over the First Contact War of 2157. The Alliance enjoys good relations with the Asari, though many privately believe the matriarchs are aristocratic and overcautious. Though humans know better than to unconditionally trust any Salarian, their shared reckless, restless, reckless ways make them natural allies against the conservative Turians and Asari. The Krogan have no unified government, but individuals are generally treated as potential criminals, a reputation most Krogan enjoy living down to. The, the Alliance has no formal contract with the Quarians. Their migrant fleet has not yet passed through any human-settled system. Interesting. The Batarians are rivals for control of the Scalian Verge. They severed their treaties with the Citadel to prosecute a colonial conflict against the Alliance. Officially, there's no war, but neither is there any peace. Systems Alliance Military Doctrine The Alliance military is of great concern to the galaxy. At first, with the Turians, they were completely inexperienced. Turian disdain changed to respect the after, Turian's respect after the relief of Shanxi, where the humans surprised them with novel technologies and tactics. The human devotion to understanding and adapting to modern space warfare stunned the staid council races. For hundreds of years, they had lived behind secure walls of long-proven technologies and tactics. The council regards the alliances as a sleeping giant. Less than 3% of humans volunteered to serve their military, a lower portion proportion than any other species. While competent, alliance soldiers are neither as professional as the Turians nor as skilled as the Asari. Their strengths lie in fire support, flexibility, and speed. They make up for lack of numbers with sophisticated technical support. BIs, drones, artillery, electronic warfare, and emphasis on mobility and individual initiative. Their doctrine is not based on absorbing and dishing out heavy shocks like the Turians and Krogans. Rather, they bypass enemy strong points and launch deep into their rear, cutting supply lines and destroying headquarters and support units, leaving enemies to wither on the vine. On defense, the human military is a rapid reaction force that lives by Sun Shu Maxim. He Shu's Maxim. He who tries to defend everything defends nothing. Garrisons are intended for scouting rather than combat, avoiding engagement to observe and report on invaders using drones. The token garrisons of human colonies makes it easy for alien powers to secure them, for which the alien's media criticizes the military. However, the powerful fleet stationed at phase gate nexuses such as the Arcturus are just a few hours or days from any colony within their sphere of responsibility. In the event of an attack, they respond with an overwhelming force. Ships and Vehicles Space Combat General Tactics Shells lofted by surface navies crash back to Earth when their acceleration is overwhelmed by gravity and air resistance. In space, a projectile has unlimited range. It will keep moving until it hits something. Practical gunnery range is determined by the velocity of the attacker's ordnance and the maneuverability of the target. Beyond a certain range, a small ship's ability to dodge trumps a large attacker's projectile speed. The longest range combat occurs between dreadnoughts, whose projectiles have the highest velocity but are the least maneuverable. The shortest range combat is between frigates, which have the slowest projectile velocities and highest maneuverability. Opposing dreadnoughts open with a main gun artillery dual, dual at extreme ranges of tens of thousands of kilometers. The fleets close, maintaining evasive lateral motion while keeping their bow guns facing the enemy. Fighters are launched and attempt to close to disrupt to, to, stop, to, disrupt, or, to disrupt torpedo range. Cautious admirals weaken the enemy with ranged fire and fighter strikes before committing to close action. Aggressive commanders advance so cruisers and frigates can engage. 
At long range, the main guns of cruisers become useful. Friendly interceptors engage enemy fighters until the attackers enter the range of ship-based Guardian fire. Dreadnoughts fire from the rear, screened by smaller ships. Commanders must decide whether to commit to a general melee or retreat into FTL. At medium range, ships can use broadside guns, fleets intermingle, and becomes difficult to retreat in order. Ships with damaged kinetic barriers are vulnerable to Wolfpack frigate flotillas that speed through the battle space. Only fighters and frigates enter close knife fight ranges or t of 10 or fewer kilometers. Fighters lose their disruptor torpedo torpedoes, bringing down a ship's kinetic barriers and allowing it to be swarmed by frigates. Guardian laters become viable weapons, swatting down fighters and boiling away warship armor. Neither dreadnoughts nor cruisers can use their main guns at close range. Laying the bow on a moving target becomes impossible. Superheated thruster exhaust becomes a hazard. Space combat, planetary assaults. Planetary assaults are complicated if the target is a habit habitable guard world. The attackers cannot approach the defender straight on. The Citadel conventions prohibit the use of large kinetic impactors against habitable worlds. In a straight on attack, any misses plow into the planet behind the defending fleet. That is true. If the defenders position themselves between the attackers and the planet, they can fire at will while the attacker risks hitting the planet. Successful assaults on garden worlds hinge upon up-to-date intelligence. Attackers need to determine where the enemy's defenses are so they may approach from an angle that allows them to fire with no danger of collateral damage. Note this is not necessary for hostile worlds. Once control of orbit has been lost, defensive garrisons disperse into the wilderness. An enemy with orbital superiority can bombard surface forces with impunity. The best option for defenders is to hide and collect reconnaissance in anticipation of relief forces. Given the size of a planet, it is impractical to garrison entire conquered worlds. Fortunately, colonization efforts tend to focus on building up a dozen or fewer areas. Ground forces occupy the spaceports, industrial facilities, and major population centers. The wilderness is patrolled by unmanned aerial vehicles and satellite reconnaissance. If a defender unit is spotted, air mobile, rapid deployment units, and satellite artillery are used to pin down and destroy them. Disruptor torpedoes, weapons. Disruptor torpedoes are powerful projectiles with warheads that create random and unstable mass effect fields when triggered. These fields warp space-time in a localized area. The rapid asymmetrical mass change causes the target to rip itself apart. Woo! In flight, torpedoes use a mass increasing field, mass increasing field making them too massive for enemy kinetic barriers to repulse. This extra mass gives torpedoes very sluggish acceleration, making them easy prey for defensive guarding weapons. So, torpedoes have to be launched at very close range. Torpedoes are the main anti-ship weapon used by fighters. They are launched from point-blank range in ripple fire waves reminiscent of the ancient Calliope rocket artillery launchers, thus their popular nickname, Callies. By saturating defensive guardian systems with multiple targets, at least a few will get through. Technology Life is a biotic. Biotics possess extraordinary abilities, but they must live with minor conven convenience. The most obvious issue is getting adequate nutrition. Creating biotic mass effects takes such a toll in metabolism that active biotics develop ravenous appetites. The standard alliance combat ration for soldiers 3,000 calories per day. Biotics are given 4,500 as well as a canteen of potent energy drink for quick refreshment after hard combat. Another issue is electric surge. Electricity accumulated in starship drive cores must be discharged and so must the electricity in a biotic user. Biotics are prone to small static discharges when they touch metal. Interesting. Unfortunately, human biotics also face suspicion and persecution, beginning with the popular misconception that they can read and control minds. Biotics symbolize the dehumanization of mankind to people philosophically or religiously opposed to gene modification, and cybernetics. Militaries are the only organizations that always welcome biotics, offering them huge recruitment incentives. Communications Methodology As the population of the galaxy increases and new worlds are settled, timely access for home users and frontier settlements with underdeveloped communication infrastructure is a growing problem. To ameliorate bandwidth issues, a sophisticated array of data caches and virtual intelligence search agent programs are available. When a user submits a query, it is first routed to the data cache on their colony or star system. At the cache, the user search agent 6 collates mountains of locally stored data to find the desired material. If the information is not available locally, the query is passed along to neighboring systems and then outward in an expanding network. 
VI oh the VI collates mountains. That's it. Agent VI collates mountains locally. VI search agents then are, the search agents in those systems replicate the search. If the desired information is found, it is compressed into a burst file and queued for transmission to the source system. The burst is assigned a priority number, a priority based on the number of queries for it. The greater the number of queries, the higher the priority. When a new solar system is first connected to the net, a selection of the most popular data is installed locally. Though storage hardware is cheap, the capacity required to hold all the data produced every day by trillions of people on hundreds of worlds is not trivial. It's not economical to store local copies of all the data available in obscure topics just in case. As colonies mature, older and less popular chunks of data filter into them as a result of queries and are placed in the local archive. Searches for obscure topics are increasingly are increasing likely to produce instant results as the archive grows. Okay. Now re read to us. After the Geth secure a location. Varan are omnivores with a preference for living prey. Originally native to the Krogan home world of Tuchanka, they are, Tuchanka. like most life from Tuchanka, savage, clannish, and consummate survivors. Tuchanka. They are pack hunters when vulnerable prey is readily available and become scavengers when outnumbered or outclassed. Their supreme adaptability, vicious demeanor, and rapid breeding cycle have made them ubiquitous and dangerous pests on many worlds. Mm. Virtually everywhere the Krogan have been, Varan infestations have followed, wreaking havoc with the native ecology. I see. The Krogan have had a love-hate relationship with Varan for millennia, alternately fighting them for territory and embracing them as treasured companions. To this day, Krogan raise them as beasts of war, one of the common subgenus of Varan has metallic silver scales, leading to the rather unusual nickname, fish dogs. Interesting. Pharos is a habitable world in the Attican Beta Cluster. Two-thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to right. thoroughly explore the ruins. Right. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. Vermeer is a lush world located on the frontier of the Attican Traverse. Its vast seas and orbital position on the inner life zone have created a wide equatorial band of humid, tropical terrain. Only the political instability of the region has impeded efforts at colonization. Many times the Citadel has opened negotiations to settle Vermeer with various criminal gangs and petty dictatorships in the nearby Terminus systems. All fell apart due to internal power shifts within the opposing parties. The Citadel has written off the colonization of Vermeer as impossible without significant political change. The Terminus powers themselves are unlikely to ever settle Vermeer. Most lack the resources to support settlement of a virgin world, finding it more expedient to steal from their neighbors than build for themselves. Faster than light drives, Sovereign is the flagship of the rogue specter's Saren. An enormous dreadnought larger than any other ship in any known fleet, it is crewed with both Geth and Krogan. At two kilometers long, its spinal-mounted main gun is likely capable of penetrating another dreadnought's kinetic barriers with a single shot. How Saren acquired this incredible warship is unknown. The prevailing opinion is that Sovereign is a Geth construct, while others believe it is a Prothean relic. Its design, however, hints at a more alien and mysterious origin. The attack on Eden Prime demonstrated Sovereign's ability to generate mass effect fields powerful enough to land on a planetary surface. 
This implies it has a massive element zero core and the ability to generate staggering amounts of power. Yeah, that's not, that's a little disconcerting. Combat hard suits use a dual layer system to protect the wearer. The inner layer consists of fabric armor with kinetic padding. Areas that don't need to be flexible, such as the chest or shins, are reinforced with sheets of lightweight, ablative ceramic. The outer layer consists of automatically generated kinetic barriers. Objects traveling above a certain speed will trigger the barrier's reflex system and be deflected, provided there is enough energy left in the shield's power cell. Armored hard suits are sealable to protect the wearer from extremes of temperature and atmosphere. Standard equipment includes an onboard mini frame and a communications, navigation, and sensing suite. The mini frame is designed to accept and display data from a weapon's smart targeting system to make it easier to locate and eliminate enemies. And mass accelerators. A mass accelerator propels a solid metal slug using precisely controlled electromagnetic attraction and repulsion. The slug is designed to squash or shatter on impact, increasing the energy it transfers to the target. If this were not the case, it would simply punch a hole right through, doing minimal damage. Accelerator design was revolutionized by Element Zero. A slug lightened by a mass effect field can be accelerated to greater speeds, permitting projectile velocities that were previously unattainable. If accelerated to a high enough velocity, a simple paint chip can impact with the same destructive force as a nuclear weapon. Wow. However, mass accelerators produce recoil equal to their impact energy. This is mitigated somewhat by the mass effect fields that rounds are suspended within but weapon recoil is still the prime limiting factor on slug velocity. Interesting. And I think that's it, guys. I think I got through all the new stuff. So, yeah, um, thank you very much for watching this Codex episode. We're going to continue on with the gameplay in the next episode. So until then, everybody, love yourselves and love each other.